we're happy this morning to have our director of sugar beet advancement and our really our, our, our top notch Cracker Jack sugar beet extension specialist, uh, Mr. Daniel Bublitz. Daniel, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and have you take it away. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Phil. I think you give me too much credit. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for the virtual breakfast. As Phil said, my name is Daniel Bublitz. I'm the director of Sugar Beet Advancement and the MSU Sugar Beet Extension Specialist. And today, my topic is going to be sugar beet cyst nematode management. So first of all, what is a nematode? So a nematode is, by definition, a non-segmented roundworm. And there are many, many different species of nematode, and they're actually one of the most populous groups of animals on the planet. In fact, a really famous nematologist from the last century actually said something to the effect of, if everything on Earth was invisible, except for nematodes, there would still be a general outline of everything. All the plants, all the animals, you could see where the soil line is, you know, you could see where towns are and things like that. So of these, several species of nematode are parasites, and they parasitize both animals and plants. And they can range in size anywhere from being microscopic up to 27 and a half feet long. So a lot of variation when it comes to nematode species. So thinking of, of uh, nematodes parasitizing sugar beets specifically, there's actually 22 different species of nematode that are known to parasitize sugar beets. So the most damaging of these species is in fact the sugar beet cyst nematode or Heterodera shachi. And so this, this one nematode is actually responsible for about 90% of the damage caused by nematodes to sugar beets. So it really is a major parasite of, of beets. So this parasite was originally identified in Germany and it was found here in the United States back in 1895. Then it was eventually found in Michigan then in 1948. And today, sugar beet cyst nematode impacts approximately 40% of the sugar beet acres here in Michigan. That's a significant economic impact, but it can be found in more acres than that. And so on the screen, I've got a, an older map from a survey done back in 2012 and 2013, looking for both sugar beet and soybean cyst nematode, which are similar but yet different groups of nematodes. And so any location with a red dot shows where uh, sugar beet cyst nematode was found. The black dots are where soybean cyst nematode was found and the blue dots were negative for either species. All right, so now I wanna take a very brief moment and just talk about the life cycle of sugar beet cyst nematode. Because I feel like, you know, even though we've talked about this before and you've seen it many times in different presentations, a lot of our management is based on looking at the life cycle and weaknesses of, of parasites in their life cycle. So, I think it's really an important place to start whenever you're looking at management. And so unfortunately, I was unable to find a diagram of the sugar beet cyst nematode life cycle. But when it comes to the life cycle, there's sim it's similar enough to the soybean cyst nematode that I was able to borrow this diagram from our friends in soybeans. So the life cycle of a sugar beet cyst nematode starts with the eggs being present in the soil. Then once a susceptible host, such as most sugar beets are planted, uh, in that soil, they actually secrete a chemical into the ground that triggers the eggs to hatch. And so once the eggs hatch, then the juveniles travel through the soil looking for the roots of their host. Once they find that those roots, they'll actually penetrate it, and then they will secrete a chemical into the sugar beet, which causes the beet to actually make specialized feeding cells just for that nematode. And so once those are formed, the nematode attaches to those cells and steals the nutrients away from, from the host plant, in this case, the sugar beet. And because of that, of it stealing nutrients in this way, we can actually see a reduction in yield of beets by about 15 ton. So it's a very significant impact that it has on, on sugar beet yields. And so once the nematodes are in their, their little feeding station and stealing nutrients in that way, uh, the females will continue to grow and grow until eventually they swell up so much that they break through the, the root and part of them is visible then on the outside of the root. And so at about that same time then, the males will actually detach from their feeding station and then travel around looking for, for females. Then at that point, reproduction happens and the female will actually store those developing eggs within her own body. 
and she can secrete some right away once they're mature in order for the life cycle to continue that year. But then in some cases, she'll actually store those eggs within her even after she dies. And then her body becomes the cyst then that can protect those eggs uh, going forward. And so an average cyst will contain about 400 eggs, although they can have as, mu as many as 600. And so that cyst kind of serves to protect those eggs. And within that cyst, an egg can survive for up to 12 years or more even. And so in a given year, we can have either two or three generations of nematodes here in Michigan. And so we can have uh, the populations really get out of control in a hurry. So in order to identify sugar beet cyst nematode, what you really want to look for on the roots anyway, are those, those females or the cysts then. And so those females are going to be about the size of a pinhead, lemon shaped, and then either white or kind of a yellowish color, as you can see in several of the pictures that I have up on, on the screen currently. And so though, and oh yeah, and so then the uh, cysts then, once they become mature and the female dies, they turn kind of a darker brown color, as you can see in the bottom left photograph. And so these, these uh, females and cysts can be present on the sugar beets anywhere from six weeks after planting until harvest. So the sugar beets show quite a few symptoms then of being parasitized by nematode, both above ground and below ground. So probably the most dramatic symptoms are on the sugar beets, or on the sugar beet roots specifically uh, when it comes to poor taproot development. And so what you'll see is stunting growth, uh, stunting and reduced growth, then abnormally hairy roots, and then also forked roots, kind of like on, that, on the left picture that we have here. And so that happens particularly if the beets are parasitized when they're young, because that, that small, uh, just newly forming taproot, if that gets infected, that can cause it to split multiple times, potentially even. So, and then above ground, some of the symptoms that we see are yellowing leaves, which can often mimic uh, certain nutrient deficiencies, and then excessive leaf wilting, uh, particularly on warm days in the summer. And that can even happen uh, even if uh, water is adequate. And so one important thing to note too, as you're scouting for sugar beets steam toad, is that the symptoms often appear very patchy in the field. So it's very seldom that you would see an entire field being evenly impacted by this, but rather you'd see large round or oval patches of wilting beets uh, throughout the field. All right, so now I'm going to shift to talking about the uh, management practices for sugar beet cyst nematode. And really, the very best management practice for this pest is to avoid it. So if you can, if you can somehow not get sugar beet sugar beet cyst nematode in your field, that's the very best way to manage it. And so beet cyst nematode actually moves uh, the cyst and the eggs both move in soil. And so what you really want to focus on is minimizing soil movement between fields. So probably the most important step here is to wash, uh, to wash equipment, but uh, especially if you're buying new equipment and bringing it to your farm for the first time. But then also if you've worked infected fields and they're moving to uninfected fields. In fact, there was one study looking at soybean cyst nematode and they found that on the, uh, on the tooth of, of a field cultivator, there were in just that dirt, the dirt that collected there alone, they found 125,000 eggs of soybean cyst nematode. So you can really move a lot of nematode eggs in not a whole lot of dirt. But also uh, soil erosion can be one method for, for eggs and cysts to move, both with, uh, with windblown erosion as well as, uh, as water erosion. Then also managing tear dirt is an important step here, because as you know, when you take your beets to the, to the factory, the piling grounds, you receive your tear dirt back, but sometimes you can receive just a little bit from your neighbor too. And so if they happen to have sugar beet cyst nematode, you can get those eggs and cysts back and dump them in your field, if, you know, so. So you wanna to try to manage that by either taking tear dirt back to fields that aren't gonna be planted to sugar beets or dump your tear dirt in fields that already have sugar beet cyst nematode. So when it comes to management, an important step is to confirm that you do have sugar beet cyst nematode in your field. And so the primary way of doing this is by, by sampling. And so the best time to sample for beet cyst nematode is in the late summer or early fall when a current sugar beet crop is growing in the field. 
And uh, so it's important to mention here too that there are some false negatives that can happen. And those are more likely when, uh, when the field doesn't have a current sugar beet crop. So really, again, like I said, the best time to sample is when you have a beet crop in your field. And so when you're sampling, the soil should not be too wet, too dry, or frozen. And the best way to do it is to remove the top couple inches of soil and take a core up to 12 inches deep. And you want to try to stay close to the sugar beet root when, when you're taking these samples, as you'd like to include some root hairs in the sample. And then you want to try to collect about 25 cores per field, or about one quart of soil. You want to collect those cores in a zigzag pattern throughout the field. Because again, uh, due to the patchy nature of nematode, you want to be sure to try to collect from several different areas of the field if you can. Then once you have the samples collected, you want to put them in a sealable uh, plastic bag, so kind of like a Ziploc bag. You want to keep the samples cool then after collecting, right around 50 degrees Fahrenheit would be ideal. So you don't want to put them on the dashboard of a pickup or in the trunk of a car or any place like that where they could get, could get warm. And then you want to try to deliver those to the MSU Diagnostic Lab as soon as possible. And so I've got the link for for uh, that lab up on the, on the screen now. And you can find all the forms and instructions for sampling there. And then I think Phil also has that link in the, uh, in the chat box. All right, so once you know for sure that you have sugar beet system nematode on your farm, there are, there are several different steps that we can take to manage this pest. Although it's important to note here too that you'll never, act, that you'll never really actually be able to get rid of the pest but there's a lot of things that we can do to, to keep it under control and keep it managed. So the first of these is variety selection. And so thankfully now we have many uh, varieties of sugar beets that are tolerant to, to uh, nematode. And really this should be your first consideration when selecting a sugar beet variety to grow on your farm. Because really this is probably the most powerful step that we can take to manage uh, sugar beets as nematode. And it's important to consider too that many of our nematode tolerant varieties have poor tolerance to several fungal diseases, including rhizotonia and cercospora leaf spot. However, I should mention here too that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, hype about the new CR plus varieties that are very tolerant to cercospora. And there's actually some CR plus varieties with nematode tolerance that are currently being tested in the Michigan sugar uh, official variety trials. And we have some second year varieties this year that if they stay on approval track, they should be available next year. And so then uh, also with the way that the tolerance works against nematode, the sugar beet uh, varieties that are tolerant, they will still be infected by nematode and the nematode will still, still be able to reproduce on these varieties, but they're poor hosts when compared to susceptible varieties. So there's gonna be poor nematode development and uh, those will minimize the, the yield impact caused by the sugar beet cyst nematode. All right, so up on the screen now, I have a photograph showing a couple different varieties in one of the sugar beet advancement trials from a few years ago. And so the center variety is a susceptible variety to nematode, and the, the varieties on either side are both tolerant. And so you can see the dramatic difference in color and in canopy size between those, those different varieties. And then here's another uh, picture from a sugar beet advancement variety trial comparing a susceptible and a tolerant variety. And you can see the susceptible variety on the left is wilting quite a bit more than the tolerant variety on the right. All right, so another important step that we can take to manage sugar beet system toad is crop rotation. And so in years that there is not a susceptible host planted on your farm, the population declines by 50% each year. And so a couple of the non-host crops that we can plant include cereal grains, corn, clover, soybeans, dry beans, and pickles. And so generally, about, it takes about a four-year or longer uh, rotation without beets to be able to manage uh, sugar beets as nematode really well. And so it's also important to note here that while we can, we can use this to help manage the pest, again, it won't ever get rid rid of the pest because again, as I mentioned before, some of those eggs can survive up to 12 years within a cyst. So you'll probably always still have uh, sugar beets as nematode on your farm, but we can really knock down the population a lot by having a longer rotation. 
And also it's, uh, you know, thinking of your crop rotation and some of the different uh, cover crops that we can plant. Uh, some work has shown that improving soil health can be really important in managing beet cyst nematode. So generally the impact of beet cyst nematode on your crop is less when you have uh, good soil health. All right, so another really powerful tool that we have for managing sugar beet cyst nematode is the use of trap crops. So what a trap crop is, is that there's certain types of oilseed radish that actually trigger egg hatching, but are not suitable host for the beet cyst nematode. So I've got a segment of that uh, sugar beet cyst nematode life cycle up on the screen currently. And so just as a reminder, when you know, it starts with the uh, egg being present in the soil, and then once that susceptible crop is planted, as I mentioned before, that, that crop will produce chemicals which trigger egg hatching. And so radish is one of those crops that when you plant it, that'll trigger the egg hatching, but the oilseed radishes are not a susceptible host. So once the, once the juvenile hatches, it just kind of wanders around and, and uh, doesn't, it's not able to complete its life cycle within the, within the radish. And so it, that ends up breaking the cycle and any eggs that hatch at the time are just destroyed. And so this can actually uh, reduce the population by 80 to 90%. So again, it's a really powerful tool for reducing the population. However, it's really important to note here that you must use the correct type of radish. So those would include either Defender, Kernel, or Biofume. If you just use any, uh, if you use any uh, radishes besides those specific oilseed radishes, so any other tillage radishes, they can actually be great hosts for sugar beet cyst nematode. And with those tillage radishes, you can actually increase your population a hundredfold. So you really wanna be careful and use the correct variety of radish here. And so oftentimes the best time to plant your, your trap crop radish is either after a wheat crop or after pickles. And if you plant after wheat, it's important to add in a little bit of uh, extra nitrogen to get your, crop, your radish crop growing well. And then generally the seeding rate that you want to target for your trap crop radish is between 10 to 20 pounds per acre. And your radish needs about 60 days uh, of growth to be effective as a trap crop. All right, so up here on the screen, I've got a, a chart showing the uh, increase in, in eggs and juveniles that can happen uh, with various type of, uh, types of host crops. And so this is really just trying to demonstrate the, the impact that you can have on your population if you plant the wrong type of radish. And so the first column here is a susceptible uh, sugar beet variety. And then the next two are uh, tillage radishes that are against uh, susceptible and good hosts for the beet cyst nematode. And you can see how much the population increases when using, using those incorrect varieties. And I did want to mention here too that Sugar Beet Advancement is currently working on a cover crop study comparing having uh, clover, radish, or no cover crop in the wheat, in the wheat uh, field before sugar beets are planted. And then we're looking at the impact on nematode populations and on yield of the sugar beets the year after. And so at this point, we've got a couple years of data from this, and we're still working on, on the project and trying to get a few more years of data. All right, so the last management strategy that I want to talk about is uh, the use of several different uh, products, chemical products generally, for, uh, for managing sugar beet cyst nematode. And so throughout the years, both Michigan Sugar and Sugar Beet Advancement have investigated several different types of, of products for managing beet cyst nematode. These include seed treatments, biologics, foliar products, and soil applied uh, nematicides, along with, uh, uh, with um, with uh, injected uh, fumigants. And at this point, most of what we've investigated has either been really not all that effective or too expensive to really make it economically feasible for, for most farms. And so one product in particular that we've looked at since I've started at Sugar Beet Advancement is a chemical nematicide called Movento. This is an insecticide and nematicide made by Bayer Crop Science. And it's it's intended to help manage root aphid and sugar beet cyst nematode. And so it's a foliar applied product with two applications, the first being in late June and the second being in early July. And the rate on that is two and a half ounces per acre. And it can be mixed with the stochastic leaf spot fungicides to make help the application easier. 
And so we actually had three locations where we tested this, two in 2019 and then one in 2020. Back in 19, we had mixed results on its efficacy. And in 2020, we saw no economic benefit from, from using it. So I'll go into each one of those trials in a little bit of detail here. Uh, the first one I'm gonna look at is, it was with the Lake Ewald Farms back in 2019. And here, the product was applied alone on June 19th and July 3rd. And here we actually saw that it had a significant increase in tons, RWSA, and in gross revenue uh, for that treated group. However, it's important to note here that root aphid was present in the field and it was a root aphid susceptible variety. And so we think that a lot of the economic impact that we saw was partially due to uh, controlling root aphid here. But if you look at the results from our nematode sampling, we did see a significant, we did see a reduction, not significant, but a numeric reduction in juveniles, eggs, and incests. So maybe it was helping with the, with the nematodes as well. So the next location that we had was, was with Laracha Farms. And we actually saw a kind of an opposite trend here, where we saw a significant decrease in tons when using Movento. And the product was applied a little bit later than what we would have liked on July 23rd and August 1st, and it was also tank mixed with super tin. However, there was no evidence of phytotoxicity uh, due to that tank mixing. Yep, so then the final location where we had this product was with uh, JNL Gremmel Farms in 2020. And here it was applied with stochastic relief spot fungicides on June 25th and July 14th. And we did see a significant reduction in juvenile nematodes when, when we collected our samples but we did not see an economic impact from using the product. And so kind of in summary here, from our experience and, our, and the work that we've done and that others have done, the, the, really the best management strategies for a sugar beet nematode are to plant tolerant varieties, to use trap crop radishes, and to extend your crop rotations. And with that, I'd like to give a special thank you to all the grower uh, cooperators who have helped to make our, our research possible. And then at the, I'll take any questions that you have now or after uh, Jeff is finished. Thank you. So we do have uh, one question that I actually put into the chat, and it has to do with the trap crops and whether they're suitable for both sugar beets and soybeans. You mentioned that those nematodes, Daniel, are very similar but different. Will the trap crop work for both? species of plants? So that's an interesting question. I, I don't believe it would. I think the, the chemical signaling is specific for the beet cyst nematode. And I think George is still on and, and maybe uh, Marisol. So if, if they know different, they can, they can correct me on that. But I'm pretty sure that the trap crops are specifically for sugar beet cyst nematode. Uh, I did not, I did see George Bird on earlier, but I do not see him now. Okay. And so, uh, and there should be adequate supplies that I'm not aware of any shortages of seed. So I think there should be, be enough supply for that if anyone's interested, so. All right, I'm going to paste the uh, seminar code into the chat again. And we have uh, a question from Clay. What would be the best practice to combat sugar beet systematode uh, crop rotation with a, the with a trap crop? fall before sugar beet planting, or would multiple trap plantings in prior years be better? So really the goal here is reducing the populations that you have in your farm, right? So, I mean, certainly having it, uh, the crop prior to, to your beet crop would be, it's always a good thing, but the, if you can get it multiple times in ahead of your sugar beets, that's, that's even better because each time you have that, that trap crop planted, you're going to be bringing down that population. So, all right. Uh, I don't see more questions in the chat. Uh, Jeff, did you mention the 90 day forecast for weather and whether or not that's we're going to see some changes long term? Uh, 
I, I didn't in this particular briefing. We, we talked about it um, a couple of weeks ago. It's again, we get a, a new issuance once a month for the long leads like that, but it, it calls for warmer than normal mean temperatures across much of the Midwest, including Michigan. And something that's a little different, we were in that equal chances category, so no forecast direction for precip totals. But uh, in the most recent outlooks, there is an area of the Corn Belt to our west and south where it does suggest drier than normal. And that was that was new. And uh, obviously not uh, not something we like to see at this time of the year, but that, that was generally for, again, the late summer and into the early fall. Definitely warmer than normal, and again, as you go west from Michigan, maybe drier. But but for here, um, for here, it was officially the equal chances. Can't All right, agree. great. Uh, I don't see more questions in the chat. Oh, so uh, Phil, I actually got go one, right. one uh, question that went directly to me as a as a message. And so the question was, what nematodes are twenty seven feet long, and where are they found? <laughs> so. That particular species of nematode, I'm not going to try to pronounce the scientific name. I'm, I'm sure I would butcher it, but it's a, it's actually a parasite of sperm whale. So they're found in the ocean. Well, I'm glad we don't have those in sugar beets. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I do have an update from uh, Dr. Chris Stefanzo, our, our nem not nematologist. She is our uh, entomologist, and she sent a a text to me saying that Western bean cutworm flight is increasing, especially in Southern counties. Uh, she says, there's been a report of freshly laid egg masses on V10 corn. So remember that newly hatched larvae need reproductive tissue to survive. That means that tassels, pollen, and silk, and they cannot survive just on corn leaves. <clears throat> and with the high variability in corn stages across the landscape, concentrate on pre-tassel corn uh, for your scouting on those western bean cutworms. Um, that's all I have for this morning. Are there other specialists on this morning that would like to give a report on something that they're seeing across the state? And I, I do have one comment uh, related to forages with alfalfa. Because of the hot, dry weather, we definitely see an uptick in our potato leaf hoppers, and those are very damaging to alfalfa, especially in early stages. So make sure and scout for leaf hoppers. In hot, dry weather, you can see symptoms of a lot of bronzing and yellowing in alfalfa, which is a great indicator that there's already been damage in that alfalfa. So uh, make sure and scout for leaf hoppers in that alfalfa that's out there. And is there anything else this morning from our specialists or educators that are on the call today? So Phil, I've actually got one more comment to make too. Uh, this is sugar beet related, but not having to do with nematode. So I was actually in a field earlier this week where I did find the Casper leaf spot on sugar beets in a commercial field. So it's important for, for everyone to keep the fungicide applications current and up to date, especially with the uh, what weather we've just had. So. All right, I don't see or hear any more comments or questions. So we're gonna end just a few minutes early today, but I'd like to say thank you to Daniel and to Jeff. And next week we will have our Q&A for hot topics with all of our specialists that are available uh, to answer your questions and to concentrate on what's going on in the fields. With that, thank you everyone and have a great day. We'll see you next week. <music>